our first, got it, our first um, performer this evening is not only a rocker who owns the baddest as cherriest red guitar west of the Mississippi, she is also a writer whose forthcoming novel is named A Story That Could Be True. I love that name. And please welcome our musical guest, Giovanna Ortiz de Candia. Uh-oh, you're on mute. Got a new Gia. Working on it. I'm muting. It says off mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Affirmative. Yay.
All right. <laughs> those songs that is amazing yay <laughs> well we're starting the night off right 
Thank you, Giovanna. I love that. That's awesome. All right. Um, now that we're all warmed up, I know I'm all warmed up. Let us. So I'd like to introduce our next reader. She embraces the full and juster qualities of being a modern poet and artist. She is a devotee of San Francisco, whose hills she wanders nearly always on foot. Named the seventh poet laureate of San Francisco, her mo most recent book is Exile Heart from Painted Horse Press. She has at least a dozen more books, both authored and edited, coming out over the next two years. And she is an absolutely lovely person. Please welcome Kim Shuck. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're an absolutely lovely person. Now, I got to say, hosting a show every week is a strength maneuver. And I know that because I've done it. Um, and it wore me out. So uh, I'm going to do a thing which I did last time I, I was on a, a benefit for the bee scrawl, which is the next check that comes in, I'm going to donate it. Um, it's probably going to be a bit smaller this time. But they will tell you that uh, that I did do it last time. I didn't just say it. <laughs> they actually got the money. Um, and to change gears a little bit, I, I won't stay in this mode, but um, I can't read on a May 5th without pointing out that it is the uh, day of remembrance for murdered and missing Indigenous women. And uh, I did write a whole book of poems about that. So I'm going to share one or two of those. Um, so they're labeled by the day. I, I wrote a poem a day for 50 days. Day 35, community lost, pipelines are the new infected blankets, have taken their first uprooted ancestors, incarcerated water protectors, severed from our communities, the missing. Day 36, how many ways are we other? Each body of village under siege, not classed as dead or taken, but undetermined, out of contact with community. Somewhere there's a clue in the rubble of peace. Day 15, borders are the sites of field amputations. And this 200 years has sharpened the clumsy exposed bones, this town this road, a canal, and locks that help keep the money flowing at specific levels. This town with razored visible bone, this machine of commerce, decorates itself with the bodies of our daughters. Their deaths are not collectively a symptom. Each one's a gasping tragedy, a name we whisper as the year thins, as the light changes, and the money passes along the Blacktop Canal, and the parasites gather at the site of the injury, a place where blood can be encouraged to flow. So a thought for our missing. These next couple of poems are from um, uh, Exile Heart. Benina, Pinta, and Santa Maria have been carried overland for far too long. Every indigenous child is handed a ballast stone at birth five adults masked on shoulder, four young women untangling rigging and elders folding sun-dried sails flaking with salt, walking the southern wagon trails to the Pacific like an unhealthy song. Singing everyone west for all time. We've carried Chris in our pockets. Our shoes are mudded with him and word of him. Our faces are marked, our hands muscle sore. Our voices are frogged with songs of the lost, the planks have been sent out into the California surf, but they float back every October. They wash back up on shore. Um, borrowed wildfire for San, um, New Mexico. Smoke, borrowed thunder, mockingbirds screaming, microwave alarms and next door. The unregulated metronome of draining water in a PVC pipe, this 
silk, the color of bruised berries is forest green, this variegated gray of cloud cover still is in the ceremonial dress. And the sky shard off to the east, so like something I found on the beach, a blue that clots in my throat. The clear red of warning lights and supermarket signs. Today I want to sing a song remembering my real name, a song that doesn't jump at thunder of fire quenched in water or fire that knows not to take houses, houses that must continue standing. And then I'm going to finish with this one. What happens to the children of warrior families when they find themselves confronted with the fact of a spring full of apple blossoms and sleeping boys whose attendant cats drape like wisdom snakes and the wild rose sings something that might be about England, the early pinking houses on this hill whisper of light and controlling light and the angles it can reveal, make you smile into this morning light make you want to be seen for yourself entire in some post-invasion moment when we're not expected to forge prehistoric personalities or even excavate them from this quarry that can sometimes fit something as useful as flint and in such astounding colors too. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Kim. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Yep. It's just a quality night. You just gonna have to deal with it. It's just a whole bunch of quality poetry up in here. So we just gonna have to take that this evening. Our next poet is a Burmese American poet, editor and educator who lives and teaches in the Bay Area. Her books include Ruins of a Glittering Palace, SPA Commonwealth Projects and Score and Bone, which is on Nomadic Press. Invisible Gifts, Poems, was published by Manic D Press in 2018. When is the, <clears throat> she is the first poet laureate of El Cerrito, California, which she was from 2016 to 2018. Her full length poetry collection, Storage Unit for the Spirit House, which is on Omnidon in 2020, was long listed for the 2021 Pen America Open Book Award nominated for a Northern California Book Award for Poetry and shortlisted for the Golden Poppy Award. Please welcome my lovely friend, Ma Sheng Wen. Ah, thank you. Oh, wonderful to be here. Thank you, Yusuf and Paul. And please support Beast Crawl. We love Beast Crawl. Um, so tonight I decided to read um, somewhat recent poems and the first one is entitled Vertigo Log. Vertigo Log. H sends a group text on International Women's Day. H has vertigo, my third friend to come down. I Google dizziness, vertigo, women, Bay Area. Another friend tells me on the phone that empaths are suffering these days. Illness, aging parents, overwhelm. Try to remember, breathe. Sit on the balcony, eyes closed to the sun. I FaceTime a bakuni. She is my mother. Her caregiver believes the abbess is slipping herbs into the water to make her sleep, untrue. The earth rotates around the sun, balancing act on axis. Summer is winter, fall is spring. Ground shifts below us. Today, I bring mushroom soup to H. A student messages me during class, mentally burned out, can't focus. Each week I meet R in Zoom. We share our worries, begin to write. And this is um, a new thought log, um, a series I'm working on, and it's called Thought Log 22. An island trickster disappeared with my laptop. Forest bathing, insight time, dark ambient, the memoir instructor announces, guts on the table, now. 
I conspire with the blue jay. Only wood things always. Hula mantras, sacred optometry, lanai operators, the extinction capital of the world. Our co-created memory concoction, orchid choir, moon jelly, wavescape. They stayed in the comedy house. Fake meat pork chops and white rice, medical pedicure, frozen cracker, paper dropper. My veins are hard to mine, must disrupt the brocade patterns. Testosterone descendants, owl template, barrier echoes. All applaud the creator. And this is, uh, this piece is entitled Grapefruit. One year I ate a grapefruit every day. My husband is allergic to grapefruit. Since my surgery, I examined three scars on my abdomen, one above navel, two longer incisions to the right and left, wingspan of a sparrow. My ovarian cyst was the size of a grapefruit. In 1964, Grapefruit, a book of instructions and drawings by Yoko Ono, was it originally published in a limited edition of 500 in Tokyo. Lying on the surgical table, heated blanket across my body. I remember my surgeon holding the complete dramatic works of Samuel Beckett, which I found both comforting and alarming. In the post-op, I noticed he has shaved his three inch beard. I wonder why tumors are compared to the size of food items. On a medical website, I read, common food items that can be used to show tumor size in centimeters include a pea, one centimeter, peanut, two, grape, three, walnut, four, lime, five, egg, six, peach seven, and a grapefruit 10. In junior high, my friend Jack said, as if it were fact, if it weren't for Yoko, the Beatles would still be together. I felt insulted being Asian American, female, a Beatles devotee, a few years later, a diehard Yoko fan. Yet I remained silent. Cut piece from Yoko Ono's grapefruit cut. This piece was performed in Kyoto, Tokyo, New York, and London. It is usually performed by Yoko Ono coming on the stage and in a sitting position, placing a pair of scissors in front of her and asking the audience to come up on the stage one by one and cut a portion of her clothing anywhere they like and take it. The performer, however, does not have to be a woman. This morning, I checked my wingspan in the mirror, layers of healing, a disappeared bruise. My friend gave me a grapefruit. I sliced it. And this is my final poem, and it's called Dream Log. We are writing from our dreams. I am not asleep. I hold one hand in the other, we notice the topography of our palms. We notice our lifeline has grown longer, our fate line shorter. I see the pain flow in channels from three scars on abdomen. We itch. We sense the flow along the torso, down the arm, through the hand. We hypnotize. I see my sister's long fingers in our hands. We face our palms upwards. I realize that my lines have aged. We hold our hands up to our face and stay there. I think about our sisters. We touch their feet. You write about last night's dream. You close our eyes. We dream in trance. I stand to eat 
from my plate. We sleep off the breadcrumbs. Thank you. Thank you, Ma, that was beautiful. I haven't heard you in too long. It's been a while. I'm really glad to see you. All right, we will keep this going. Our next poet um, this evening is originally from Philly, like me, and is a Bay Area poet and book editor. He received his MFA in creative writing from San Francisco State and was the 2017-2018 editor-in-chief of 14 Hills, the SFSU Review. His work has appeared in journals and anthologies, including Poetry, Puerto del Sol, and Best American Non-Required Reading. His first poetry collection, The Move, came out on Nomadic Press in fall of 2021. Please welcome Keith Donnell Jr. Hey y'all, can, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, so first, just wanna say thank you uh, to uh, uh, including me uh, in this event. Um, Beast Crawl was one of the first events that I went to when I came to the Bay. And I was just like, damn, I didn't know this was even a thing, you know, that this was even possible, you know? It's really special. And um, please, please uh, donate, contribute as, as any way you can. Um, so the first piece I'm gonna read, uh, it's my longest one, uh, and it's called Eulogy Delivered by Ozzie Davis at the funeral of Malcolm X. And it's after uh, the eulogy that, that he delivered. This final hour, this quiet place, alarm has come. Dim lit stairwell, torn from it, searing eye test, smoke, hope, cope extinguished, no wind gone with us forever. Four alarm down here. We were kids wandering, strung lead and fog, our home of bones, where his heart was and where his people are still, runaways out in the woods again. The reforms lost footing that were meet once again in alarm to shard these last monuments, rhythm, for alarm, lost cause punchlines, a sewer bin grace used to those who crossed air, full vault. He ran, dove, defended air, donners, bones and buttons, fragments eaten to the death. Dark nights in the memory of man, fortunes faked but nonetheless, Proud, still braver, more gallant, young shams, peons. Then this here brother laid out before us now, so bright, shining, and beautiful, so holy before sun conquered, stale eyes. Say the word again. Yeah, that's what I thought. Wood ash wants me too. Afro Amor icon, Afro Amori kin was a mass tear to wash my stem, us too cool, alive in words, no known bodies returned, a knee to power, wars galore, half off all remains of men, runaways out in the woods again. Malcolm had stopped being a Negro years ago. It had become too small, too puny to wreck a word form. No, Malcolm was badder than that. Malcolm had become aggro, a field again, and he wanted sole disparity that we, that all his people came to. The roar of those who wall, consider it their duty. Still, we laugh, we eat, we've grown down. To revive him, prisms of memory, to save ourselves by riding harm out of history of our turbulent times, capital will ask, what alarm fires to budget cut in this stormy, controversial, and bold young crap's hand, and we wall miles. Many would wall sister away. Frame this man, for he is not a man, but tandem, a sermon, a subverter, no anomaly, all that rumble young man rumbling and we wall miles. They'll say he was half ape, an old attic slave, quite musty and sun-kissed, whole canon liberating evil, and to dwell and smear 
and dismay. Delude no tattoos, my brother. Elude never God's touch. Humor, have harm smile at you. Did you ever really glisten to him? Did he ever ED a mean thing? Wash me over for him sale, assassinated with violin synths at any public disco trance. For if you do you, were now him and you, if you truly knew harm, you, widow, wide, we missed so near him. Malcolm was our human donor, our loving main back road. This was his meaning to his people. And in honoring him, we honor the blast out of ourselves. The brother surely slayed is all missed, undead, and we laugh a much braided rope. Consign these mortal remains to earth, our common mother, and fall. Seek core in the knowledge that what they mace, pin to ground, ice no more, not never, amen, but acid wash. Walls came forth again to us, dust, and we will know him then for what he was and is, a brick, our own black shining brick who didn't hesitate to fly because he loved us so. Um, the next one's called Final Notice, thanks. Final Notice. Their fathers leased to buy our fathers, bullied low income, melon toned bodies, Philly Queens, Detroit Kings, off fire escape dreams. But even then, our eyes gravitated to a blessed location. When ice was lurking, furthest hills, our eyes always wandered to furthest hills. And as ice grew bolder, prolapsed wider, I realized the, the furthest hills were not God. And so I began clerking for Mantan's hat. Because at a very early age, I'm Mantan too. Cold soot, the hot grinning face of what we wandered through. Runaways out in the woods again. And never satisfied to intern a living God, ice was lurking to make a statement, out to bind something monumental, something new, something worse, an Evers boy, Allah, send truth here, not overseers, truth, not overseers, and protect my people's rent. Um, so I have two more, and uh, these are, it's kind of, uh, changing gears a little bit. With these, I've, I've really been lately trying to really get into the language, to the sound, um, to the rhythm and, and the pacing of it, to really almost let those kind of drive the car. Okay. So this one's called Shit Talker. Trouble was the wine got all sweet and low. Rude cherry red rum mishit sweet and lows. Sweet and low laced with fractal gold was a slick, crooked, cross-draft, bold, bone was smooth, seductive bolds, bold facts strung from a villainous pole for the punch clock clocker, crow sizzling and stay type clockers, clocker built for the rampart locker, neon Savoy, sweet gum, sweat house swisher. They bound to bring them hot chili swishers, swisher trains looking to dilate this prisoner. For the riot kept breaking across my rear view. Daybreak foundations, down devil rear views. Rear view done caught it all, bruh. And you? And uh, for the last one, uh, it's called Prayer. And um, once again, thank you for including me. And please, you know, support Beast Crawl any way you can. Yeah. Prayer. Oh, deluxe Cadillac divine sky, make a place for me. From high hog plastic pleasures, deliver me. No pine box kerosene tombs, not for me. I'm tired of revelry. Mud money and swine hungry, make a place for me. I look around, all about this civic garden square, fig in my hair, nailed close with care skewed my steps home by amethyst air. 
O filed sonnet of black jean pocket, I look around. Spring coolant, vase water, corn flower kitchen twirl, ice box of milk and pearl, world upon world, gin and tonics, missing my girl. Searching this cold killing floor for a place for me, amen. Thank you, y'all. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Keith. That was amazing. Um, I love to hear you read. That was awesome. I love your poetry. So many good poets tonight. Oh my gosh. And so um, that reminds me, it's it's my job tonight to uh, ask you out there for things. And so um, this is the part where you type beastcrawl.org into your browser and then you click on support and you support us. You can do that a few ways. You can donate money. You can donate your time, uh, which we, we hold that quite valuable as well. Or there's a new button where you can help us fundraise. I believe that if you sign up, it puts a button on your Facebook page. And then you can just passively and lazily support us. You don't even have to exert yourself. It's a wonderful thing. And that's what this evening is all about. So keep Beast Crawl in mind. And uh, you can also click on the link in the chat if you are here in the room with us. Um, but if you're out there on the face pages, then you should definitely type beastcrawl.org into your browser. And if you're wondering, because you might be, because perhaps this is your first encounter with Beast Crawl, why it is called Beast Crawl, well, let me tell you, it is called Beast Crawl because Beast is Pig Latin for East Bay. So there you go. You learn something new every day, don't you? Anyway, more poetry. Our next reader is a writer based in San Francisco. Her work has appeared in publications, including The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, McSweeney's Quarterly, Concern, One Story, Granta, and Ziziva. Recently, she was a Stegner Fellow in Fiction at Stanford University. Her most recent book is the critically acclaimed short story collection, Out There, from Random House. Please welcome Kate Folk. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for asking me to be part of this event. Um, I realized that I think one of maybe the first reading I ever did was through Beast Crawl. It was a quiet lightning show at Oak Stop in 2014. Um, so that was a, a really important show for me. And um, I love the festival and I think it's really great. So I'm happy to, um, to help support tonight. So I thought I would just read a story from um, from the collection, which came out like a month ago. Um, it's called Heart Seeks Brain. At happy hour, my coworker Sarah and I bond in the way of women by cataloging the flaws of our internal organs. We discover we have a lot in common. Our carotid arteries are of similar diameter, thicker than the feminine ideal. Both our spleens are mildly engorged. We both have always wished our small intestines were a few feet longer, like those of the world's top fashion models. We have longed also for smaller, daintier kidneys. Sarah tells me about her high school rival, Betsy, whose kidneys were the size of a toddler's fist and perfectly shaped. Betsy was the darling of all the renal boys, who in Sarah's school were the cutest. But Betsy never had anything on my liver, Sarah says. She tells me about her abnormally slender liver, only eight centimeters thick. I'm jealous and say so. In eighth grade, I tried to slim my liver to win the affection of Robbie Brookshire, a precocious hepatic fanatic. I consumed nothing but cranberry juice and flaxseed oil for weeks until I was so malnourished I could hardly get out of bed. It didn't work anyway. The one time we made out in a Wendy's restroom, Robbie immediately put his hands under my shirt. His fingers pressed beneath my right rib cage, probing until he could feel the lower edge of my liver. He pulled away, disappointed by my liver's breadth, and we avoided each other for the next five years. But that was junior high, 20 years ago, when many boys were liver crazy. They were unsophisticated, having barely hit puberty, and were only mimicking the liver mania that was at that time ubiquitous 
in music videos and the centerfold pages of men's magazines. I play up my jealousy of Sarah's liver because I'm eager to gain her trust. We're sitting at a round metal table outside a boardwalk restaurant a few blocks from our office building. The sun is setting over the ocean and we both have our backs turned to it. I asked Sarah out for drinks because she's just started working at our office and I could use a new friend, a real one, not just a coworker. My friends have all coupled up with men who are feeding off their organs and whose organs they are feeding off of, a symbiotic process that will continue until they break up or one of them dies. If and when they return to me, single again, they'll be diminished in body and spirit, feet swollen from renal failure or eyes jaundiced or breath coming short, a piece of their lung or liver or kidney on a shelf in some man's house. Sarah tells me it's the same with her friends. They all claim it's worth it to be in a relationship despite the risk of permanent deformity. I know how it is, Sarah says. You're so relieved to escape a relationship more or less intact, and then you get lonely and jump right back in for another round with someone new. You think if only you could find a partner whose desire manifests in a relatively non-invasive way, but of course it's a foolish hope. The more someone loves you, the more he'll want to meddle with the most vital parts of you and vice versa. The only way to not hurt someone is not to love him enough, to remain unmoved by the thought of his organs pulsing beneath a thin layer of skin. I've never heard it put so well. I nod dumbly and peel open a packet of crackers. I tell Sarah how I'm always on the lookout for a heart man who will appreciate my lopsided ventricles. I thought I found one last week on a first date with a thick set mathematician who wore unfashionable straight leg jeans that somehow suggested sexual competence. His eyes flared at the mention of my left ventricle, which is three millimeters longer than the right. I continued with cautious hope to detail my circulatory system. My blood is type O. My red blood cells are on the small side with a diameter of six micrometers. I described my aorta in lurid detail. His mouth had fallen open. Later in his car, I drew back my hair and allowed him to press his thumbs along my external jugulars, which are unusually pronounced for a woman. My date, it turned out, was a classic vain man. Sarah rolls her eyes and says, vain men are tedious. They all wanna be vampires, she says, it's pathetic. I disagree. I've always preferred the attentions of circulatory men. In my view, a vain man is simply a heart man whose development has stalled. Sarah asks if I've heard from the mathematician since our date, and I admit he hasn't called yet. Shouldn't have led with the jugulars, she says with a shrug. The sun has slipped behind the docks. We order a dozen oysters and another bottle of wine. We're quiet while the waiter sets the platter of oysters in front of us. He takes his time arranging the paper napkins and miniature forks. He's young, tall, voluptuously handsome, and he lingers over our table, staring at our abdomens while he lines up our forks and tops off our wine glasses. A gastro man, typically shameless. Sarah picks up an oyster and dabs it with horseradish. I ask what she's into and she blushes. I always send him into livers, she says, just to see what a guy will do for me. I know he's committed if he'll go under the knife to get me a tissue sample. I've got jars at home and a mini fridge. It was like a sport in my 20s. Once I had a piece of their liver, I lost interest. I knew I had them. Anyway, my real thing is spines. She rushes on. I know, I know. And believe me, I wouldn't expect anyone to do it who I wasn't really sure about. I'll spend months feeling a guy out. It's hard to find a partner who's open to the idea of even localized paralysis. That's sort of what the whole liver thing was, like a test of his devotion. If he's not willing to give me a liver sample, there's no way he'll go through lumbar puncture to get me a vial of spinal fluid. And that's only the beginning of what I want from him. Sarah's words hang in the air. I'm shocked by her cavalier attitude regarding spine kink. I wanna choose my words carefully so as not to offend her. I think it's great you have such a clear idea of what you want in a partner, I say finally. Our attractive waiter has turned on the heat lamps. When he comes to check on us, he forgets himself and asks an awkwardly phrased question. How are your stomachs responding to the oysters? Fine, Sarah says, shooting him a look meant to contain him. He retreats, humiliated. You can never pick out a gastro man anymore, she says. They used to all be pervy little dweebs in their mom's, in their mom's basement. Now they look like that. She sips at her wine, and for a moment, I dislike her. Sarah's disdain for the waiter seems hypocritical, given her own extreme tastes. What about you, she says, what's your thing? I pause, considering whether to give my usual tame answer of kidneys or tell her the truth. 
like Sarah, I'm into the nervous system, but my passion is for the brain itself. My ideal relationship would be with a heart man who possesses a powerful methodical brain, preferably an expert in some STEM discipline. My dream is that we will marry and he will allow me to take his brain from him year after year, a tiny bit at a time, through shock treatments and partial lobotomies until he can't function on his own and I have to care for the drooling husk of his body until it expires. It is only for this that I'd surrender pieces of my literal heart. In my whole life, I've told only a few people about this desire. Brain play remains the ultimate taboo. A person can function with three quarters of a liver, a lung trimmed at the edges, a few punctured veins. But once you fuck with the brain, consent becomes an issue. Sarah waits for my answer. I know she doesn't really care about me, doesn't find me interesting. If anything, she might use my deviance against me in the future when we're both vying for promotion. So I tell her I'm into kidneys and she shrugs and says, popular choice. The waiter brings our check. On my way out, I slip him my number. We meet under the boardwalk when his shift is over. We lie on the sand and he pulls out a stethoscope, running its cold diaphragm over my abdomen. He listens to the oysters and crackers and wine work their way through my digestive tract. This is the furthest I'll let him go. A gastro man is lucky for what he can get, even if he's young and gorgeous, and the waiter seems to know this. I stare at the moon and imagine it looks down on my love, the human casing of the brain I have dreamed of ever since I was a girl, crouched behind the refrigerator door, fondling heads of cauliflower without knowing why. That's the end. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I love that story. So romantic. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right on. All right. Our next poet is a Black Latinx writer and educator. She is the author of Mother Morphosis, which came out on Nomadic Press in 2016, Dear Animal, which came out also in 2016 on Nomadic Press, and several chapbooks, including A Brief History of the Selfie, Dear Animal, released on Nomadic Press in 2016, and winner of the 2018 Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award. She curates the reading series Lyrics and Dirges and is a co-director of the Berkeley Poetry Festival. Her most recent work can be found in the Academy of Poets Poem A Day series and at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco with the Voice of Trees projects. She is also the absolute best horror movie date ever. Please welcome M.K. Chavez. Um, thank you for that introduction, Nazila. Um, thank you, Paul and Yusuf and everybody else who's involved in this amazing um, bringing back of the beast. I think it's wonderful. It's really nice to have something to look forward to. And it's just, it's a good time to kind of be revisiting some of the best things that we haven't had for a while. So it's lovely to see the faces of people who are here. I'm just uh, really grateful and I hope people will give as much money as they can. Um, and Nazila is the best horror film date. And you know, I, hopefully you won't mind me telling people Nazila, but Nazila and I started watching horror films um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, every Sunday evening. And we have continued. They still do it. So, um, yeah. So I've, I've watched over 400 horror films. Uh, I made a list. And uh, luckily, I can say that I um, wrote a book that is um, based on, uh, well, I'm looking at identity through American horror film. So hope you enjoy. I was a mixed race zombie. I wasn't born a relentless creature of resurrection. If I could, I would eat from the top of my head. I would feed the seventh chakra, that mysterious lotus, a thousand petals and 20 layers of 50 more petals. Once I was so invisible that I ate my way into existence. I consumed the bigot cashier from Joanne Fabrics, the man at Whole Foods who wanted to cut me in line. I ate the wolf whistler and his wife. Then I said, I'm pure consciousness because my lotus 
Eat your lotus. My lotus eats fear. My lotus lingers at the gateway of history. Loving versus Virginia. Limnal skin, one drop or more. My brother named me dark magic. My uncle sang brown sugar at me. Children of the emerging paradigm, who will pick you for their team? My lotus has eaten every inquiry into mixed race. My lotus mestahise, my lotus in Spanglish, my lotus in Salvi Noir, my lotus in Afro hyphenate, my lotus eating the binary and then belching. Lotus of mystery ethnic and not enough boxes. Lotus of the multiracial multiverse. The most terrifying part of the movie is never what you think. What if zombies are just misunderstood? Um, you don't have to worry. Um, there aren't any spoilers, I don't think. The two Marias, demon in my trachea, shining her transformation into a rite of passage. Damon, as interrogation of childhood and mother's schizophrenia. Demon as woman part that turns its head 360 degrees. Demon is vomiting and making a mess. When asked to clean up, scratches, help me onto my belly. Damon as little helper. Demon in my hand, stealing money from the donation box, flipping off the nuns, spray paint on the side of the church. There is no God. Demon stirring the pot of anxieties, theological horrors, castration scissors, and disorder of the nerves. Demon buying pot. The boys roll joints for her so that Damon can buy school lunch and pretend to be normal. Demonic possession, lighting up my mouth. Screaming obscenities at doctors and priests, the cult of domesticity in disarray. Father wept and threw himself from a window just to avoid the conversation. Demon in my urinary tract taking a hot piss on patriarchy and watching the steam rise, the rise of feminine monstrosity. Damon in the canal. Third eye that lives between my legs. Damon says, Captain Howdy is I waiting. Want 20 minutes the of poetry reading while you're painting. Mm. Thank you. And, and that is uh, this, my sound effects. All right. I have a couple more for you. Letter from Rosemary's Baby. In her red room, I emerge among poppy heads that populate the wallpaper. Mother dreams that her bed is floating on a vast ocean. I watch how they undress her, this vessel, this woman undone. I pick her because she's sacrilegious and sleeping with Satan. I approve of her short hair and mini skirts. My mother is eating raw meat and upsetting the neighbors again. I am the unexpected, the leading role in hot pink, a mass hysteria, the little nightmare, men making decisions about women's bodies. I'm primal baby gaze. Mother loves me like Mary who doesn't need Joseph. I bring woe wherever I go. I love a single mother all to myself. Jaws. The tension goes on for 81 minutes before we actually see the creature. Is it vagina dentata or is it Maybelline? Consider fine china, a spiked Venetian chastity belt. 
And this is my last one. Metaphysical hand, metaphysical interior with hands. Earth. My hands watching on as a mother forces her daughter's hands to become one with stone. Air. My hands drew pubic hair on Barbie's smooth snatch and scandalized the onlookers. Hands became angry ghosts and grew eyes. Water. Hands wept and became undulating voyeurs. Fire. My hands were detached and coherent in service of potential destruction, bejeweled in Hamsa charms, elegant. They were attached to my body by a long gold chain, zombie hands, vampire nails. They grew teeth. They crawled around on stage, demanding tips. Thank you. Thank you, MK. That was amazing, as always. I love that you write poetry about horror movies. It's my jam. Yay. Our next poet lives in Oakland, California, and has published multiple chapbooks and full-length books of poetry, two of which are On Sunday, A Finch and Collapse, both on Nomadic Press, were nominated for California Book Awards. She has been nominated for six Pushcart Prizes and is nominated as Oakland's first Poet Laureate. She has graced many stages, hosts weekly writing workshop, on to six, is co-host of the quarterly themed reading series, Moondrop Productions, host of the Badass Bookworm podcast and the Badass Bookworms Lit Waft. Her most recent book of poetry, A Pretty Little Wilderness, came out on Be About It Press in June of 2020. Please welcome our next poet, my friend, Cassandra Dalek. Hi, so good to see you, Nas, and everybody. Really good to see you. <laughs> um, okay, dear Echo. There are no heroes here, none of us flawed, broken beings. Some of us are just put together with a better grade of super glue. Some of us carry our chip pieces on our sleeves. Some present museum fine bone china, gilded frame, the smooth marble hands of David. And still we cut, leave gnarly gashes and egos bruised. It's what we do with the after. Elaine Brown was beaten and raped by her comrade. She went on to be the first woman to head the Black Panthers. Ask Araminta what it is to run for your life, to go back south facing dismemberment and shackle. Ask us about children we raised with nothing, pushing strollers of laundry and wick milk, broke down on the side of the interstate, accepting rides with strange men while clutching our children in our sweaty arms. Do you know what it is to beg shelter? play dead like a possum, write whole ass books after your kids have gone to sleep, get no sleep, running from library to library on public, public transit, exposed on sidewalk, thick pig meat, big leg gal, as if you were born to rub their gristle. The stories your elders tell would singe your ears. We had no Facebook to shout misogyny out. It was never easy to protect what lies between our thighs, not to mention the lies that come alive in our heads. One negative comment in your gut forever, while each compliment dies with the wind. Humans are shitty people, sloppy and horny. We do weird things for touch, weird things with touch. We are touched, dropped on our heads, born sinners, whatever that means. It's up to you to break the spell, eat the whole damn apple, tell the snake to go to hell. When did being a victim become a fashion trend? Listen to the caged bird sing, raise up and fly your coop, baby. Listen to your first mind. Gut is God. Mary J. Blige said so. It's not who you are. It's just what was done to you. Just another thing to wash off in the shower, down the drain with bloody mucus, with semen, with bad intent. 
not yours to carry. Don't let your voice fade into a whisper reflecting the light of your sun, but don't get swept up in the need to out everything. Wolf criers are celebrated. The internet commentators cheer downfall. How did he hurt you, little bird? Let you down, leave you waiting, shrinking as the moments tick by to the unwanted other woman you grew out of long ago. Did he grope you, bully you into giving it up? Whichever orifice or tender piece of you, you held sacred, you tried to protect, you gave in. What is the new definition of abuse? All these new meanings for words. Some of us unsure what rules we live by. We are angry, we are forgiving, we are confused. This is an unfinished letter. I can't see through the vague. I'm not blaming, only asking, what is it you want here in the hot stage light? I wanna hold you, but I'm trying to understand what outcome should come. Should we all hide or weaponize our shares till it's our turn to fall? Yes, even the men in the movement, not all men, but always men, even those with a gift of gab away with words would have their way with you. Narcissists everywhere, lacking empathy and tormented social media, the most distorted reflection of all. And this is um, to exist in the is was. Shamefully, I do not possess the backbone everyone believes me to. I watch war for entertainment. The man in my house watches murders for fun. Video salad eating and awake in the added hour of sun. We're not living honestly around here, but much closer to being normal. I can't say what's true, how I hate when a man puts his weight on top of me, a man of any size, how it's everything I can do not to push him off me and out the door. I can be bent and pushed, pulled and slapped, but more weight on my chest is where I draw the line. Enough cement blocks to build a prison already live there. I left work on Friday and studied the wall next to my couch, 48 hours, fetal position, didn't wanna see or be seen or spoken to or, or, or wrote a letter saying, I can't talk to you, I can't visit, I can't. Received a letter back that spoke to me of the impermanence that is now. As much in love as is was planning the future, this isn't the only right now. I docu-sign my life away looking for the bees on the flowers, the spring that never comes, the winter dry and cold, the closet big enough for all that I buy because I can't buy your freedom and wouldn't even know where to look for my own. Maybe somewhere on the bottom of the sea where the trash and failure has fallen on bleached out reef. Colorful fish zip in and out of death's cape, the last residents in bombed out cities, the last refugees. White countries try to trade their brown refugees for a paler misplaced. The holly jolly oligarchs on a beach in Syria sip tears and spit gravestones like sunflower seeds. Next door, my neighbor smokes cigarettes in her car and plays 80s love songs. She's hiding from the people in her house, too. Sing this poem like your Alexander O'Neill. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, love. Uh, when I was 16, my cotton candy hair, red pout of stolen Revlon red. When I was 16, stumbling drunk most nights, Doc Martens or Stan Smith's. Every pair of jeans had torn knees from falling. When I was 17, still uncoupled, sleeping with anybody who cornered me drunk enough, made me feel wanted for a minute. I hung pics of a Navy guy I'd flung with on Fleet Week, then met Dwayne, who was 25, working as a plumber next door, told him he could leave the lights on, wrote him like I had all the confidence. I did not. Knew he wouldn't be able to give me up after that. Our first date, walking around Fisherman's Wharf, pouring liquor into soda bottles, his sheepskin coat, tall and lean, high cheekbones, dark, sexy, disturbed eyes. I was lucky to make it out alive, but I did right before I turned 18. I'd met Andre while I was still with Dwayne. Dre, who was six months younger than me, was inexperienced and boyish with an oversized mouth, usually sneering. I needed to split his bad attitude into that giant hey Kool-Aid grin and my dreams I still need a glimpse of those big teeth working over juicy fruit and thoughts of me. What can I say? I've already written entire books about impos how impossible he was, how I was 19 before I was done, and then 51. When I look back, I want to know if I ever knew 
what love was or is, how much is blind desire and addiction, wanting someone to be something or make you feel some kind of way. At 15, 16, and 17, I wanted someone to care about me more than I wanted any other thing. I haven't changed much. When writing about those years, I still chose to write about who I loved each year as if that would tell you who I was. Oh, thank you. Give Beast Crawl lots of money and, and come out and I can't wait. Thank you, Cassandra. Ah, oh, it's awesome to hear you. You look marvelous. <laughs> and Fonji. Right, y'all. Well, it appears all good things must end. Um, but uh, it's not over yet. So you're still here and I'm here. And we have one more reader this evening. Um, she is an arts and culture theoretician slash practitioner working at the intersections of cultural production, community development, and community well-being to foster transformation in marginalized communities. She is the first appointed poet laureate of Oakland, California, which she is currently, in addition to being the founder of the Lower Bottom Players Theater Company. Her most recent book is Incandescent Poems of Power, released on Not A Pipe Publishing. She is a national treasure, y'all. Please welcome Ayodeli Nsinga. Thank you so much, Naz. I bet you I am also the last person to donate to Beast Crawl. But I invite anybody to take my title. Go for it, okay? Let's see who can get in there and best me. All right. Let's do some poetry. Record it. Hey, Vanessa, it's my turn. Thank you. So every now and then I get worried about us. I'm kind of worried about us. This piece is called The Young Man Stood. The young man stood. He said he spoke as a child, speaking in a room filled with women who had lost children. A child stood to speak as a son in a room filled with mothers who had lost sons. He spoke as a grandson in a room where Mamie Till's testimony still stay in the air. He spoke of life in a room with Oscar Grant's mother and grandmother speaking the story of how women fill rooms looking out to children husbands and fathers who have gone missing, women walking wounded by a system that's eaten their men, buried them, living in decaying schools, commercial prisons, acres upon acres of graves, both deep and shallow, final resting atop potential, stilled in a room full of women. A grandson stood to represent the missing men stood in support of crying women as we wept. Many praises on his head, sweet breath, his moving chest, bless his beating heart, standing warm, living, our hopeful dreams, dreams, as we weep over their death. This is called The Room Full of Broken Birds. The newborn still talk to the dead. The dead go as the new are born. Entering, exiting, a room full of broken birds called life. We are born dying. The young man said it, life brimming in his eyes, his full beard, untouched by gray, his life still full of possible, undulled by broken birds flapping ineptly. Some refuse to fly. Others are all weak, 
some without feathers, horror stories amongst the beautifully plumed, the aerially erudite who paint themselves upon sky like sunlight high above the smell of bird shit. Yet bound by the same rules, all will perish. None are forever. The aviary is all there is. There is no more. And sorry, nothing less than feathers, blood squawks from fledglings trying to influence pecking orders that melt and mean less than nothing as dead go and new are born. In this room filled with broken birds, we live in the shadow of our own limitations, our, our isms, our doubts, our mean fears, our desperate dreams, all flapping wildly. A room full of broken birds where ideology is born and dies to be reinvented on the beaks of new birds flying high on old ideas they just hatched. In a room full of broken birds. This piece is called Brickhouse Women. Brickhouse women don't dream God. They dream the ocean, walking on water through fire, arising like mist over rivers, overcoming with the sunrise, standing up when the sun sets. And they dream of falling. They dream of flying without wings. They dream solutions, miracles with eyes open, pray with hands moving. They only go forward. Brickhouse women endure. They endure cracks in the wall, water rising, sky falling, world on fire. They endure like music, like the smell of dirt after rain, like flowers in the desert. They are the foundations on which we build, standing after storms, last house on the block, make you want to holler in between, trying to make life brick houses built on rocky ground, still standing. Brick house women endure. This piece is called, let me go ahead and do the one before. This piece is called Same Song. So you want to know why my song don't change. What's my song? You go where I go. It been through what I've been seen, what I've seen it by default, know what I know. It's my song. How it going to change when life don't change? It can only change that much. Me and my song are storming, out in the rain, falling down, holding on, trying to get up, letting go, can't take it no more. My song is waiting for you to pay your dues. It is paid over and over. My song is the song of dues being paid, waiting for you to pay your bill. My song been wandering. Passed through Birmingham, lived in Mississippi, walked up to 66 into Chicago. Under the bridges on the outskirts through shacks and red line houses. My song strolled in Harlem, tried to spread its wings, found itself in St. Louis, Pittsburgh. My song tried to soar. It took the train traveling in the back. It drug tails of cotton in the lynching tree, believing it could be more than it was. It rose up when pressed down, exploding, angry, frustrated broke on Western streets in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland. It struggled, it stormed, it raged, it pointed the way out of no way. My song is looking for itself. Now how my song gonna change when ain't nothing change? My song know what it know and that's what my song sing. My song is mine, it's what I got. I wrap myself up in it, stand on it, I stand for it and it stands for and by me. We are our foundation. Everybody got to have a home. 
I don't need a strong foundation. My song is searching for home. Children are living my heart, keeping the beat. It know what it know. And that's what I say. Got one more piece for you, Carl. The way we walk. The story's still being written. Madness, magic, and infamy spilling off the page. It's too heavy to carry. We tip over under the weight to rise dead center, keeping us off balance, stumbling uphill. Sometimes you have to grow wings, feed it to the wind, or go where the water flows without sound. We walk wounded through lean slivers of real life, distracted, forgetting to count the blessings essential to the thought of continuing. We smell of struggle, overcoming, or the effort of trying to distance ourselves from that narrative. It's hard to find even ground. Movement is life, so walking forward is written on the inside of eyelids, sewn shut to reality like a nail window shade. The light still spills through, shadows everywhere, especially in bright light and in the contemplation of the qualitative nature of our lives. We grow schisms like mushrooms, tended in the dark, defying statistics. We are the confusing side of complexity, hanging like the moon off center, sometimes invisible, but still omnipresent even when you can't decipher its shape. We step over the bones, sometimes falling where others have fallen, sometimes using their falls to propel us. We keep walking, going forward, because movement is life and we are alive, walking wounded on the bones of the fallen and those who stood on them before us, holding up the sky, singing in the dark. That's it. Thank you. Donate to Beat Scroll now. When you have to do it, she says, because she's an Oakland Poet Laureate, and she told you. Thank you so much, Ayodele. That was amazing, Ashe. All right, y'all. Um, you know, you always think something's over. And then it's still not quite over. I have found that everything I do for others, I do for myself. So what I'm going to do for you right now is I am going to give you time to donate to Beast Crawl. You can click on the link if you're here in the, in the event, or you can go to beastcrawl.org. And I'm going to give you that time because we are going to welcome back our amazing musical guest this evening, please come back, Giovanna. Thank you. Standing in a crowd, am I the only one you care to see? You've got the strength. 
Give us some more.
Thank you. I Woo! Did it! I love that. Woo! That's so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where can we find you? Bandcamp? Where are you? I want yeah, I'm on Bandcamp. Okay. Um, so I can then, put, uh, something in the comments section in the chat. Yes, please. Put something yeah. in the comments section. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Woo! Thank you, Woo! Giovanna. That was amazing. I want to thank all of our readers. Um, Kim Shuck, Ma Shen Wen, Keith Donnell, Kate Folk, MK Chavez, Cassandra Dalit, and Ayo Deli and Zynga. Thank you so much for being here for this Beast Craw fundraiser. We have raised some funds, Paul Corman Roberts. We have raised Thank a you. few funds up in here. So Yay. for those of you playing at home, I know I, I said I would give you time to donate. But you know, you have all the time in the world because even after this show is over, you can click on the link. You can go to beastcrawl.org and you can click on the support link. So I would encourage you to do that because you should definitely support your local arts, art scene and artists. So make sure you do that. And thank you to Paul Corman Roberts and Yusef Alawe for doing this right here. Thank you, Naz. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, one and all. It was beautiful. Great show, everybody. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Yay. All right. Thank you, Naz. Thank you, Paul, Yusuf. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who showed up. Hey, Saturday, May 28th. It's going to be awesome. 
Yep, yeah, it's going to be in that small little area, and we're just everybody's going to be everywhere, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to be magical. We promise. Information table in front of chapter 510, and uh, we'll be there probably starting from around 3 p.m. At least. Like that. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so come by, and we'll have some uh, stuff for you, you know, to pick up, and including a map, and uh, you can buy a shirt there, show you support, walk around in a shirt. Yay. All right. We'll have legs running from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., 5.30 to 6.30 p.m., yes. and 7 to 8 p.m. And, yes. we to, and, and we hope to announce the matching with the curators with the venues by this time next, no later than this time next week. That's the hope and prayer. Thursday, yeah. so, mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for your patience. Thank you for your generosity. Right. And thank, thank you, you for your time. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you all.